be allowed to increase rents by a maximum of 10% after a two-year contract. Tenants will also be given priority to renew their leases for another two years. DAB lawmaker Vincent Cheng is the chairman of the committee that vetted the bill. More than 200,000 of people living in this very bad conditional uh, subdivided effects, especially in the old buildings. So today we have this bill to have more protection for those people who live in the subdivided effects, especially for their rank, because we know that they are paying a very high rank. It can compare to the very expensive place in unit. So this bill mainly protects the rank percentage add-on and also for those two and two years, like four years contract so they can have more time for them to stay. No need to worry about uh, keep raising their, their rank. The Secretary for Security, Chris Tang, says eight officers from the disciplined services face a criminal investigation for allegedly mocking the death of a Marine Police senior inspector. The eight have been suspended from duty after apparently gloating over the death of Lan Yun Yi, who was killed during an anti-smuggling operation at sea last month. Mr Tang spoke to an interpreter at LegCo. I'm disappointed and angry that such remarks were made by our officers. Teamwork is very important to law enforcement agencies and we were shocked to find that such um, remarks were made by our own officers. We would assess whether any criminal offences were involved and if there's enough evidence, um, we could make um, arrests and lay prosecution. And if um, no criminal offences were involved, we might um, proceed to disciplinary investigations on these officers. A parliamentary inquiry in Brazil into the government's handling of the pandemic is expected to recommend that President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with various offences, including crimes against humanity. The president's critics have long accused him of refusing to take COVID-19 seriously, despite the deaths of more than 600,000 Brazilians. Luis Enrique Mandetta was Brazil's health minister when the virus took hold. He says herd immunity was Mr Bolsonaro's response. There was some other people around him that had a theory that to treat the disease just like a flu. So for a long period of time, he never wore masks. He would shake hands with people. They deliberate didn't make the trials with Pfizer to buy the vaccines in the beginning. So it delayed about 10 months the Brazilian response to the disease, and that made a huge difference on it. And President Putin has ordered that Russians be given paid time off work amid concerns over rising COVID infections. Nine days from the 30th of October have been declared an extended non-working week. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Good morning and welcome to RTHK's Hong Kong Today. I'm Janice Wong. And I'm Samantha Butler. Coming up, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, admits the national security law has damaged Hong Kong's reputation. The Equal Opportunities Commission says now is the time to make it illegal to discriminate against mainlanders. The government has urged to help local exporters get their products overseas in time for Christmas amid a backlog at American ports. And Manchester United come from 2-0 down to beat Italian side Atalanta 3-2 in the European Champions League. The chief executive, Carrie Lam, has acknowledged the national security law has damaged Hong Kong's reputation and the government should do more to explain its work to the rest of the world. The comments came on a new RTHK program featuring the chief executive. Joanne Wong reports. Carrie Lam spoke about her latest policy address in the government's work over the past four years on a new RTHK TV program called Overview Policy. The chief executive said some external forces and Western media have played up routine enforcement of the national security law, likening it to the suppression of human rights and freedoms. 
呢方方面咧，真係要做多啲。有 To counter that narrative, she said the government needs to explain its work better. Mr. Slam also stressed the need for the government to tell it like it is when it comes to Hong Kong's constitutional order. For example, she said the government needs to state clearly to the people that the central government has comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong and that it also respects the SAR's high degree of autonomy. The CE added that Hong Kong must remain a cosmopolitan city so that it can play its role as a connector between mainland China and the rest of the world. Joanne Wong. The government has proposed stripping district councils of their role in implementing community and minor work projects. Home Affairs Secretary Casper Choi says there just aren't enough councillors left to represent the public. Hundreds of councillors quit while dozens of others failed to meet new requirements over being patriotic enough to hold the position. Kelly Yu reports. At a large co panel meeting, officials said district councils should no longer review funding requests for community involvement projects and minor works programs. They told lawmakers that the Home Affairs Department and Leisure and Cultural Services Department could take up this role between them instead. Home Affairs Secretary Casper Choi pointed the recent resignation and disqualification of hundreds of district councillors as he explained why such a change is necessary. He spoke through an interpreter. It would not affect the function of、uh, district councils, but they are district councils with too few members. It undermines their ability to represent the constituents, and also there are projects and works which are put on hold because of this. The DAB's Leung Chi Chang, who chaired the meeting, cast doubt on the government's plan. He noted that some councils, such as Island's District Council, still have plenty of members left, and said it has been possible to approve funding for some projects. In response, Mr. Choi said approved projects would not be scrapped if the changes to the role of district councils are made. The government's proposal will be submitted to Lachco's Finance Committee for consideration. Kelly Yu reporting. Lawmakers have approved a bill that will limit rent hikes for tenants of subdivided flats and give them priority to renew their lease. It takes effect from January, but some lawmakers complained it didn't set limits on the initial rental charge. Wendy Wong reports. Under the new law, rent hikes will be capped at 10% at the end of a two-year contract. Tenants will then be given priority to renew the lease for another two years. While a majority of lawmakers supported the changes. They urged the government to do more to control the initial rental level of subdivided flats to prevent landlords from raising rents substantially before the amended law takes effect. The chairman of the committee that vetted the bill, DAB lawmaker Vincent Chan, said the passage of the bill is an important step towards protecting grassroots tenants. More than 200,000 of people living in this very bad conditional、uh, subdivided flats, especially in the old buildings. So today we have this bill to have more protection for those people who live in the subdivided flats. Secretary for Transport and Housing Frank Chan, for his part, said the approved measures strike a balance between offering protection to tenants and protecting the rights of landlords. But he stressed it is not feasible for the government to regulate rents under the first lease. During a housing panel meeting earlier in the day, Mr. Chen was also asked when the government could achieve its target of shortening the waiting time for a public flat to three years. Currently, the average waiting time is 5.8 years. The transport and housing chief said the government could achieve the target in about 10 to 20 years. And in about half an hour's time, we'll be getting reaction from Soco, which represents grassroots people, about the rental limits for subdivided flats. 20-year-old Hong Kong woman Poon Hiu Wing was killed in Taiwan in 2018. Yet her alleged murderer has yet to be brought to justice. Chan Tong Kai, her boyfriend at the time, is in Hong Kong, citing the pandemic as the reason he cannot voluntarily turn himself over to Taiwan. The case was cited by the government in 2019 as the reason Hong Kong's extradition laws needed to be amended, so there was a system in place to send suspects to Taiwan. Yet the extradition bill sparked months of social unrest that only ended when the National security law took effect last July. Yesterday, the mother of the murder victim lashed out at people she says are involved in the suspect's case, saying they don't have the courage to meet her. 
She said she invited officials, DAB lawmakers, Mr Chan and his parents to meet her outside government headquarters yesterday, yet no one showed up. Ms Poon became emotional when she brought up her daughter's case. They always keep dragging their feet. It's so hard for us. It's so difficult bringing up my daughter. The SAR government did nothing and they don't care at all. They just got Reverend Peter Kuhn to be Chan Tung Kai's spokesperson. He keeps protecting Chan. I want to ask him, did he really help my daughter? She was also a student from an Anglican school. Mr Kuhn needs to live up to churchgoers and his own conscience. The Secretary for Security, Chris Tang, says he has sympathy for Mrs. Poon. He called on everyone in Hong Kong to urge the authorities in Taiwan to stop playing political games and let Chan Tong Kai turn himself in. I think the whole issue is Taiwan, China do not allow Mr. Chen to go to Taiwan to face his responsibility. Here I would like to reiterate, no matter what Taiwan, China do, they won't change the fact that Taiwan is part of China. On a separate issue, the security secretary, Chris Chang, says eight officers from the disciplined services face a criminal investigation for allegedly mocking the death of a marine police officer. Lam Yun-Yi fell overboard after their patrol boat was hit by a suspected smuggler's vessel last month. The eight officers have been suspended from duty after apparently gloating over her death. Mr. Tang spoke by an interpreter at LegCo yesterday. I'm disappointed and angry that such remarks were made by our officers. Teamwork is very important to law enforcement agencies, and we were shocked to find that such um, remarks were made by our own officers. We would assess whether any criminal offences were involved, and if there's enough evidence, um, we could make um, arrests and lay prosecution. And if um, no criminal offences were involved, we might um, proceed to disciplinary investigations on these offices. Mr Chang was responding to a question from legislator Tony Dare, who asked whether the government could look into introducing legislation to ban people from such behaviour. Mr Tang said there was no legislation in Hong Kong to outlaw hate speech, but there were other laws that could deal with inappropriate information and sedition. Police say they've seized seven modified speedboats and eight engines in an open-air car park in Tung Chung that are suspected to be linked to smuggling activities. Ben Chair reports. Officers took action after receiving intelligence that suggested the car park was being used to store the souped-up vessels. They also found tools that could be used to repair the boats. Chief Inspector Yu Pok Han said they believe syndicates hid the boats by transporting them from the sea and storing them on land. A 17-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of constructing vessels for the purpose of smuggling. Ben Che. The chairman of the Equal Opportunities Commission, Ricky Chu, says now is the time to make it illegal to discriminate against mainlanders. As Maggie Ho reports, Mr Chu said the body has received a lot of complaints regarding years. The head of the Equal Opportunities Commission told an RTHK program that it's made a number of proposals to the government. He said the proposals focus on three main aspects. People of the same ethnicity discriminating against each other, people being discriminated against on the basis of their residential status, and discrimination relating to where a person comes from, even if it's within the same country. In the past three years, we've received a lot of reports about mainlanders being discriminated against in Hong Kong. An NGO also recently said new migrants, including children and adults, are facing a lot of discrimination at workplaces or schools. That's why I think now is definitely the time to legislate, and we should do it as quickly as possible. The commissioner also said he hopes the EOC would be given the power to investigate, collect evidence and initiate legal proceedings after receiving complaint. He said at present the body cannot start any litigation if there are no victims to give evidence. No victims to give evidence. Maggie Ho. 
Lawmaker Jeffrey Lamb is calling on the government to help out local exporters who risk failing to get their products overseas in time for Christmas amid an unprecedented backlog at American ports. The Business and Professionals Alliance legislator says local businesses have been forking out 10 times more money than usual to hire shipping containers because of a shortage caused by the cargo surge in Long Beach and Los Angeles. Mr Lamb told Joanne Wong that under normal circumstances, Christmas merchandise would have already arrived by now. Christmas season merchandise do have a limitation. After Christmas, like Christmas tree, nobody's going to buy it. If it is shipped on a boat, it will get there by the end of November. So it will still hopefully get to the store and then get to the customer on time. But right now, we are looking at Long Beach and Los Angeles. They still have about 50, 60 ships waiting to get their merchandise or containers unloaded. There is already an improvement. And then after it's on shore, then it will need truck drivers to take them to the destination. But right now, there is also a shortage worldwide. If the goods are not in the buyer's hand on time, Hong Kong exporters or factories may face different consequences, such as delay payment or buyer refuse to pay. If the buyer decided to cancel the order, then the Hong Kong company will be stuck with the merchandise. If it is pure Christmas merchandise, it will be stuck for one year. And then the next year, whether the Christmas merchandise will be in trend or not, that would be a question. The problems that you mentioned, it has to do with what's happening overseas. So how can the government assist? Yes, some are overseas, some are here. If we can allow more cargo airplanes to leave Hong Kong, to leave Hong Kong with loaded Hong Kong merchandise, that would help. And to be more flexible with the So I hope, I hope Hong Kong government can adopt the procedures in the mainland and help us to get the border open as soon as possible. But how can that help manufacturers in Hong Kong, having difficulties in shipping their merchandise to their customers? In the old days, you know, before COVID, Hong Kong companies, they have their staff traveling back and forth. The management, they do both in negotiation, negotiation, order taking, designing in Hong Kong and then take it to the factory, do the manufacturing engineering. But now, you know, they have to be seated on one side. So communication is a problem. So with the border open, uh, this kind of company start to travel back and forth. It would speed up and make procedures much easier. And that's why we are encouraging, we, we are asking the government to see if they can get a business visa or channel with, with a uh, quota, like a hundred quota per or a thousand quota per week, uh, destination to destination. That would help the manufacturers in Hong Kong. That's Business and Professionals Alliance lawmaker Jeffrey Lam. Embattled mainland developer Evergrande says in a filing to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that it will resume trading today, but warns there's no guarantee it will be able to meet its financial obligations. The company suspended trading on October the 4th as it struggled in a sea of debt and faces a default, with its predicament fueling fears of contagion through the Chinese economy. The firm has already missed several payments on its bonds and a 30-day grace period on an offshore note is up on Saturday, leaving investors concerned about what will happen. The world's most traded cryptocurrency Bitcoin has reached an all-time high, hovering around 66,000 US dollars.
Facebook almost 70 million US dollars for deliberately and repeatedly breaching an order to supply information linked to its takeover of the animated graphic startup Giphy. The Competition and Markets Authority said the fine, the first for such an offence, sent a signal that no company was above the law. Facebook called the penalty unfair and said it was considering its options. Facebook has announced it's hiring 10,000 workers to build its metaverse. Kara Swisher is a podcast host and opinion writer for the New York Times. She explains what the metaverse is. Well, it's everything. Like, what's the world, right? Like, they try to put it into a regular context. The world, our physical world, is the metaverse of reality, right? And so a metaverse is a place you might live digitally. It's sort of a digital universe where you can do anything. Uh, you can have an economy. You, you can live there. You can transact there. You can play there. Presumably, you can have sex there. So it, it's a place where that surrounds you in a digital sense versus a a reality, a physical sense. And one of the things that's clear is what they're hoping to is you also mix the metaverse with the real world, right? So augmented reality, overlays, VR that you might use in real stores, things like that, or, or, or Google Maps that you can actually see in front of you in the real world. So the idea is that we live a digital life and we live a physical life. And the, the ability to merge the two is what you're talking about, essentially. And so some people think it's a great idea and that's just the way things are going. And other people think it's sort of a, a dystopian idea. That's Kara Swisher, a podcast host. On Wall Street, the Dow and the S&P have risen again, narrowly missing records following a wave of generally good earnings that have eased worries about inflation and clogged supply chains. A report by the U.S. Federal Reserve said transport constraints and shortage of goods caused significantly elevated prices in most areas of the United States, slowing economic growth. But with the latest batch of corporate results, investors are becoming more confident that higher consumer prices will not derail the recovery. The Dow touched an all-time intraday record and finished with a gain of almost half a percent at 35,609. The S&P also gained 0.4% to 4,536, less than a point from an all-time high. But the Nasdaq shed 0.1% to 15,121. A UN report has warned that fossil fuel extraction rates must almost halve by 2030 if the world is to avoid a temperature rise of 1.5% above pre-industrial levels. Current projections predict a steady rise in fossil fuel production. But there is an exception. Denmark has already put a halt to all new oil and gas exploration. Dan Jarensen is the country's climate and energy minister. He explains where Denmark will get their energy from. We've decided to phase out coal and, and gas uh, production in Denmark. So it goes without saying it, it hasn't been an easy or, or cheap decision to make. But we do think that if we are to be carbon neutral in 2050, it doesn't make sense to still extract oil and gas and sell it to others. So uh, we cancelled uh, all future licensing rounds and decided to set an end date in, in 2050. It is a costly decision because uh, even though... We are a country that has been making a lot of uh, resources, a lot of money on, on the oil industry. And of course, there's thousands of people working in the industry. So we need to combine this with a new strategy where we will create more jobs than we lose. So there's more jobs to be found in offshore wind, for instance, than there is in offshore oil eventually. It's important for us that it's not only as many jobs or more jobs that's being created. We need to make sure that it's also in the same part of the country and maybe even preferably for the same people. The International Energy Agency, they estimate that you can cover the world's electricity demand for the entire planet, not once, but 18 times with the wind resources that are there now. So we, and we're not even close to, of course, uh, exploiting that, it goes without saying. So uh, we have a lot of potential there, the North Sea especially. So we will heavily expand our uh, wind capacity, uh, offshore wind capacity in the North Sea. We've decided to build the, the world's first uh, artificial uh, wind energy island. It will be an, an island uh, the size of 64 football fields, uh, 80 kilometers out in the sea. And that means that we can then have hundreds of wind turbines connected to this island. So instead of having one offshore wind farm that's connected to the shore of one country, Denmark, 
this will be a hub that will be connected to several European countries, and it will have, when it's uh, when it's done and and the full capacity is there, uh, uh, an ability to generate 10 gigawatts of uh, green electricity. That's enough to supply 10 million European households. That's uh, Denmark's climate and energy minister. Coming up next here in Hong Kong today, we'll have the sports news. For a safe and healthy living environment, owners should not alter the drainage systems of buildings on their own. They must ensure proper maintenance of drainage pipes and should appoint qualified professionals or contractors for regular inspection and arrange early repair if seepage or defects are found. They may apply for loans or subsidies from the Buildings Department and the Urban Renewal Authority. Visit bd.gov.hk for details. Good morning. I'm Adam Jones with Sports. We start with football's European Champions League and a bit of magic from Cristiano Ronaldo. Shaw now sends over a cross from the left. Cristiano Ronaldo! Manchester United staged a dramatic second-half comeback to beat Atalanta 3-2 in the Champions League at Old Trafford. The Italian visitors led 2-0 at halftime. Then goals in the second half from Marcus Rashford and Harry Maguire tied it before Ronaldo scored the winner to move United top of Group F. Villarreal are third in the group after a 4-1 win over young boys in Switzerland. In Group B, Barcelona have won their first game in the Champions League this season as they got past Dinamo Kiev 1-0 at the Nou Camp. Group leaders Bayern Munich thrashed Benfica 4-0. The BBC's John Bennett reports. It's two wins in a row for Ronald Koeman and Barcelona since the international break and after all their on and off pitch issues they now have some momentum going into El Clasico at the weekend. Gerard Piquet scored their first Champions League goal of the season, a volley at the back post in a game they dominated. De Jong, Dest and Fatty were guilty of missing good chances but they finally have three points on the board. Meanwhile in Lisbon, Benfica managed to frustrate informed Bayern Munich for 70 minutes but the floodgates finally opened after a wonderful Leroy Sané free kick. An own goal, Robert Lewandowski's 42nd goal of the calendar year and another Sané strike followed as they maintain their perfect start to this season's group stage. Chelsea beat Malmo at Stamford Bridge but lost a few key players to injury. The BBC's Paul Scott rounds up the rest of the results. It was a mixed night for Chelsea, who thrashed Malmo 4-0 at Stamford Bridge, but saw both Romelu Lukaku and Timo Werner come off injured. The defending champions remain second in Group H behind Juventus, who maintain their 100% record after a Dejan Kulisevsky goal gave them a 1-0 win at Zenit St. Petersburg. Meanwhile, Red Bull Salzburg top Group G after a 3-1 win at home to Wolfsburg. Lille were held to a 0-0 draw at home by Sevilla. In cricket, Sri Lanka have qualified for the Super 12 at this year's T20 World Cup. Here again is the BBC's Paul Scott. Sri Lanka have qualified for the Super 12 stage of the Men's T20 World Cup with a 70-run win over Ireland in Abu Dhabi. When Hindu Hasaranga hit 71 of 47 balls as Sri Lanka posted 171 for 7, Ireland were bowled out for 101 in the 19th over. Meanwhile, for the first time, Namibia have won a match at a men's T20 World Cup. After losing their opener to Sri Lanka, they beat the Netherlands by six wickets. It keeps alive the Southern African nation's hopes of reaching the Super 12 phase of the tournament. David Visa saw them home. He finished 66 not out of 40 balls as Namibia chased down 165 with six balls to spare in Abu Dhabi. Namibia will play Ireland on Friday with the winner qualifying for the next stage of the competition. Now we turn to baseball. The American League Championship Series between the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox is tied at two games each and they're now playing Game 5 at Fenway Park. The Astros are leading 3-0 in the sixth inning. All three runs were driven in by Jordan Alvarez. In the National League Championship Series, the Los Angeles Dodgers staged a late comeback to beat the Atlanta Braves 6-5 in Game 3. The Dodgers now trail two games to one in the best of seven. Game 
four starts just after eight o'clock Hong Kong time. And there were wins for the Milwaukee Bucks and the Golden State Warriors on day one of the new NBA season. The Bucks began their championship title defense by beating the Brooklyn Nets 127-104 behind 32 points by Yanis Antetokounmpo. Steph Curry had a 21-point triple double in Golden State's 121-114 victory over the LA Lakers. And that's your look at sports. Thanks, that's it. Now the weather before the news at 7. Sunny intervals with a few showers. The top temperature will be around 28 degrees. Winds light to moderate easterlies. Right now it's 26 degrees, relative humidity 88%. RT8K News. It's 7 o'clock. I'm Barry O'Rourke. A parliamentary inquiry in Brazil into the government's handling of the pandemic is expected to recommend that President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with various offences, including crimes against humanity. The president's critics have long accused him of refusing to take COVID-19 seriously, despite the deaths of more than 600,000 Brazilians. Luiz Enrique Mandetta was Brazil's health minister when the virus took hold. He says herd immunity was Mr Bolsonaro's response. There was some other people around him that had a theory that to treat the disease just like a flu. So for a long period of time, he never wore masks. He would shake hands with people. They deliberately didn't make the trials with Pfizer to buy the vaccines in the beginning. So it delayed about 10 months the Brazilian response to the disease, and that made a huge difference on it. The man accused of carrying out the deadliest attack on a U.S. high school has pleaded guilty to the killings. Nicholas Cruz has been charged with 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. Prosecutors have described the killings in Florida in 2018 as cold, calculated and premeditated. They're seeking the death penalty. Speaking in court, Cruz apologised to the victims. I am very sorry for what I did and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. And I am doing this for you, and I do not care if you do not believe me. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me. But I have to live with this every day. And it brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes. Allies of the jailed Russian opposition activist Alexei Navalny have hailed the decision of the European Parliament to award him its top human rights prize. The Secretary-General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said Russia's actions showed how crucial it was to show support for Mr Navalny's pro-democracy campaign. NATO allies condemned the uh, failed uh, assassination attack against him and uh, NATO allies have also called for an international uh, investigation. I think this is a part of a, a pattern where we see that uh, Russia has... Uh, become more oppressive abroad and more oppressive at home and more uh, aggressive abroad and therefore I welcome the fact that uh, a strong voice, uh, an important politician in Russia has been awarded this uh, uh, prize. President Putin has ordered that Russians be given paid time off work amid concerns over rising Covid infections. Nine days from the 30th of October have been declared an extended non-working week. Mr Putin urged people to show responsibility and get vaccinated. Only about one in three Russians have been fully jabbed so far. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Thanks to Barry O'Rourke in our newsroom. This is Hong Kong Today with Janice Wong and me, Samantha Butler. Coming up in the next half hour, we'll talk to a grassroots representative about the 10% cap on rent hikes now allowed for subdivided flats. The Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, is accused of crimes against humanity because of his handling of the coronavirus. They deliberate didn't make the trials with Pfizer to buy the vaccines in the beginning. It delayed about 10 months the Brazilian response to the disease, and that made a huge difference. And we hear from a student in Myanmar who was one of hundreds of people released from prison in an amnesty. But first, the government says eight officers from the disciplined services face criminal investigation for allegedly mocking the death of a police senior inspector last month. Marine officer Lam Yun Yi fell overboard after their patrol boat was hit by a suspected smuggler's vessel last month. Timmy Sung reports. The eight officers were suspended from duty after apparently gloating over the death of Lam Yun Yi, who was killed in an anti-smuggling operation at sea. 
At a national meeting, legislator Tong Li Zhe asked whether the government could look into introducing new legislation to ban people from such behaviour. Security Secretary Chris Tang said he had noted that after the death of the Marine officer, some people made satirical remarks on the internet and posted a song suspected of expressing hatred toward the police. He spoke through an interpreter. The government is deeply regretful and angry about these cold-blooded acts to which the whole society should strongly condemn. Ms Tang said eight officers from the discipline services had been suspended from duty over comments made online regarding the Marine inspector. We were shocked to find that such um, remarks were made by our own officers. We would assess whether any criminal offences were involved and if there's enough evidence, um, we could make um, arrests and lay prosecution. And if um, no criminal offences were involved, we might um, proceed to disciplinary investigations on these officers. The security chief added that while there's no legislation in Hong Kong to outlaw hate speech, there are other laws in place that can deal with what he called inappropriate information and sedition. That's Timmy Sung. 20-year-old Hong Kong woman Poon Hiu Wing was killed in Taiwan in 2018, yet her alleged murderer has yet to be brought to justice. Chan Tong Kai, her boyfriend at the time, is in Hong Kong, citing the pandemic as the reason he cannot voluntarily turn himself over to Taiwan. The case was cited by the government in 2019 as the reason Hong Kong's extradition laws needed to be amended, so there was a system in place to send suspects to Taiwan. Yet the extradition bill sparked months of social unrest that only ended when the national security law took effect last July. Yesterday, the mother of the murder victim, Poon Hiu Wing, lashed out at people she says are involved in the suspect's case, saying they don't have the courage to meet her. Damon Pang reports. Poon Hiu Wing's mother got emotional as she met the press outside the government headquarters. They always keep dragging their feet. It's so hard for us. It's so difficult bringing up my daughter. The SAR government did nothing, and they don't care at all. They just got Reverend Peter Kuhn to be Chan Tung Kai's spokesperson. He keeps protecting Chan. I want to ask him, did he really help my daughter? She had invited Chan Tong Kai and his parents, Reverend Kuhn, Security Minister Chris Tang, Police Chief Raymond Siu, as well as DAB lawmakers Starry Lee and Holden Chow to meet her. None of them turned up. The case of her daughter's murder triggered the extradition bill controversy, sparking months of protests from June 2019. Mrs Poon pointed out that Chan Tong Kai wasn't tried for murder and has only served time in jail for money laundering after taking her daughter's possessions. She said officials can set a precedent by putting him on trial in the SAR. In response to media inquiries, Reverend Kuhn said there's nothing he could do if Mrs Poon chose to misunderstand him. He also said a lawyer appointed to represent Chen Tong Kai in Taiwan has made it clear his client wanted to surrender last year, but they were told that he needed to wait for negotiations between the authorities in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Meanwhile, the security secretary expressed sympathy for Mrs. Poon. Chris Tang accused the authorities in Taiwan of playing politics. I think the whole issue is Taiwan-China do not allow Mr. Chen to go to Taiwan to face his responsibility. Here I would like to reiterate, no matter what Taiwan China do, they won't change the fact that Taiwan is part of China. He said Taiwan authorities should allow Chan Tong Kai to go to the island to turn himself in. Damon Pang reporting. The chairman of the Equal Opportunities Commission, Ricky Ju, says now is the time to make it illegal to discriminate against mainland Chinese people, noting that the body has received a lot of complaints regarding such prejudice in recent years. Mr. Ju told an RTHK program that the commission has made a number of proposals to the government. He hopes new laws will cover people of the same ethnicity, discriminating against each other, people being discriminated on the basis of their residential status, and discrimination related to where a person comes from, even if it's within the same country. In the past three years, we've received a lot of reports about mainlanders being discriminated against in Hong Kong. An NGO also recently said new migrants, including children and adults, are facing a lot of discrimination at workplaces or schools. That's why I think now is definitely the time to legislate, and we should do it as quickly as possible. 
The Legislative Council has passed an amendment bill which will limit rent hikes of subdivided flats to protect tenants living in those units. Under the changes, owners will only be allowed to increase rents by a maximum of 10% after a two-year contract. Tenants will also be given priority to renew their leases for another two years. The chairman of a committee that vetted the bill, DAB lawmaker Vincent Cheng, welcomed the bill's passage. More than 200,000 of people living in this very bad conditional uh, subdivided effects, especially in the old buildings. So today we have this bill to have more protection for those people who live in the subdivided effects, especially for their rank, because we know that they are paying a very high rank. It can compare to the very expensive place in unit. So this bill mainly protect the rank percentage add-on and also for those two and two years, like four years contract, so they can have more time for them to stay. No need to worry about uh, keep raising their, their rank. To discuss this further, we're now joined on the line by Shi Lai Shan, a community organizer at the Society for Community Organization, or SOCO. Good morning, Ms. C. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on the program. So uh, what's been the uh, general response from uh, tenants of subdivided flats about the new legislation? Uh, we, we, uh, we welcome the pass of the bill uh, because in the past uh, 20 years, actually, uh, the uh, power be, uh, of the, uh, for the, uh, is too unbalanced, actually, is totally the, in favor of the, um, the landlord on, there's totally no uh, legal protection for the tenants. So the pass of the bill uh, can uh, provide uh, a few more protection for the tenants. So, uh, uh, and so they can have a more stable um, contract, and then they also they can have a, a, a can estimate the, the the increase of the um, the rent level. But but it's a pity that they the the government refused to um, include the uh, setting uh, uh, the the setting of the rent level uh, in in the bill. So we request the government to include the the setting of the uh, rent level in the bill uh, in the coming uh, two years. Do you think the new well, law will offer enough protection to tenants? I think it's still not enough because uh, the, at the beginning of the rent setting is not it's not uh, um, it's not uh, still not uh, included in the bill. Yeah, but 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 it already protests some uh, uh, protection for the tenants. Yeah. And a roundtable lawmaker, Michael Chen, uh, who abstained from voting yesterday, described the bill as not the real deal for rental control because it does not regulate the initial rent, like you mentioned. How do you, I mean, how do you think uh, um, the government should, uh, should uh, handle this? I mean, is it possible for them to set an initial um, rent level? I mean, because there are so many subdivided flats right now. Rating uh, 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 acceleration for each threat, so they can base it on this uh, figure to uh, 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 regulate the initial range. So they can, uh, um, for example, um, uh, uh, add more twenty percent for the uh, uh, rating estimation amount and uh, set as uh, uh, initial range. So, um, because um, the government, they already have some uh, 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 figures. Of course, um, if they have more information about uh, how much the the subdivided so now provided in the market, but but we think actually the 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 rent level of the subdivided so already is too high, so we cannot base on this to set the initial uh, um, initial rent. So we can base on the uh, original government. They can, they have the, on the one threat, and that increase some a uh, certain percentage. And uh, because uh, this new law does not regulate the uh, n- initial rent, the tenants have to pay. Do you, are you worried that landlords can? Uh, I mean, landlords will will set the rent level as high as they want. Yeah, yeah, we worry. Uh, um, we worry uh, that at the beginning they already we increased the initial rent, so. So they already, and actually, actually now the initial rent is too high already. 
Right. And what more do you think uh, the government can do to help people living in subdivided flats? Um, I think uh, first they should include uh, the initial rent uh, in the bill, and the other is that they should um, as, uh, have more uh, protection on the rent, uh, safety of the subdivided flat. And of, um, of course, um, they should provide more uh, uh, land and, and provide more public housing. So they, what these people, uh, what they want is they can, they, they can be rehoused for public housing as soon as possible. And, a bit, and at the, in between the day, waiting time, to, waiting for the public housing, they can provide more social housing for them and, and more and subsidy to help, to help them to leave, to leave their uh, property. Yeah. All right, we'll have to leave it there. But thanks for joining us this morning. That's uh, Shilai Shan, a community organizer from the Society for Community Organization. More than 19 months after the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, 240 million people have been infected with COVID-19 and 4.9 million have died. In many countries, the number of cases is now rising again and a president is being accused of so badly mishandling his country's reaction to the disease that it amounts to a crime. Brazil experienced one of the largest and deadliest outbreaks in the world. Now, after a six-month inquiry, a special congressional panel has formally recommended President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with crimes against humanity. Luis Enrique Mandetta was Brazil's health minister in the early days of the pandemic. He said Mr. Bolsonaro's approach allowed the virus to spread. There was some other people around him that didn't belong to Congress that had a theory that you could get an immune response by making people get sick. So for a long period of time, he never wore masks. He would shake hands with people. They deliberately didn't make the trials with Pfizer to buy the vaccines in the beginning when they first offered. So it delayed about 10 months the Brazilian response to the disease, and that made a huge difference. But the conservative commentator Leandro Rochelle says the report is politically motivated. If uh, it could be uh, better handled, yeah, we can discuss that. But it's a really big stretch to talk about crimes against humanity. If people wanted to impeach the president, uh, is there right? You have a political process for that. But in the end, there is no public support for an impeachment. The commission was uh, led by opposition senators, so they want to inflict the major blow to the government looking for the next uh, presidential election. Things are looking grim in Russia, where coronavirus cases and deaths are rising and millions remain unvaccinated. President Vladimir Putin has ordered that all Russians should be given a week off work on full pay, starting at the end of this month. From Moscow, here's the BBC's Steve Rosenberg. Vladimir Putin. 都可能沒辦法在聖誕節之前在美國的商店發售。同倉庫營運商都要迅速增加產能以免做限制運力可能只會剩回不夠百分之五呼籲政府將基礎設施升級 
Britain is one of three countries which Morocco just announced it wouldn't allow planes to fly to or from. No surprise then that health leaders there have been calling for the Prime Minister's Plan B to be brought into play by imposing coronavirus restrictions to try to halt the rising case numbers. The head of the NHS Confederation, which represents health bodies, has warned of stumbling into a winter crisis. They want mandatory face masks or COVID passports. But the health secretary, Sajid Javid, rejected the call for now. We must all remember that this virus will be with us for the long term and that it remains a threat, a threat to our loved ones and a threat to the progress that we've made in getting our nation closer to normal life. We're looking closely at the data and we won't be implementing our plan B of contingency measures at this point, but we'll be staying vigilant, preparing for all eventualities while strengthening our vital defences that can help us fight back against this virus. But the NHS Confederation says health service risks being overwhelmed by rising COVID case numbers. Saffron Cordery from NHL, NHS providers, which represents health trusts, thinks the rules may need to change soon. It's likely that that time will come soon because we know that numbers are rising. We know that COVID cases are rising. We know that infections are rising. And we know that those being admitted to hospital is growing. So all of those numbers are on the upward trajectory. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, the Centre for Health Protection said there were four new imported cases involving three women and a man. The patients aged between 23 and 43 flew in from Indonesia, Singapore and the Philippines. In Myanmar, hundreds of political prisoners have been released from the country's notorious prisons. The military leader, General Minon Hlang, has promised in total 5,600 detainees Uh, first I was arrested, I think they would like to threaten and pressure us not to do that kind of demonstration again. She says her time in prison was tough but didn't change her mind about the protests. She says she believed the people who've been released will again try to and oppose the authorities. At first, not so bad, but the food and the place are not clean enough, the drinking water, and even there is no such kind of uh, beating or something like that, but they always shouting and using some inappropriate words and cursing. We have to order our family to bring some food and some medicine, you know. Uh, I cannot handle it, but uh, after that, I need to survive, you know. I have to go through it. Honestly, I didn't change my mind, you know. We stand for the truth and we stand for the justice. And uh, I won't change my mind in the future as well. Because we experienced a um, feeling of democracy and the uh, Aung Suu Kyi leadership. We went it back, you know. We will fight till we win. On Wall Street, U.S. stocks rose for the sixth consecutive day as companies continued to report strong third quarter earnings. After the bell, electric car maker Tesla reported record third quarter revenue and profits. It said it made a net profit of 1.6 billion U.S. dollars for the quarter, the second time it surpassed 1 billion. Shares of Tesla fell half a percent in after hours trading. Futures markets are indicating a flat open for the Hang Seng in Hong Kong and the Nikkei in Japan. Stay tuned for late, the latest financial analysis with Money Talk after the news at eight. Joining Peter Lewis today, our personal wealth advisor, Enzio von File, Jack Siu, CIO for Greater China at Credit Suisse. And discussing Hong Kong's MPF scheme is Francis Chung, executive chairman of MPF Ratings.
Researchers say the French oil company Total knew at least 50 years ago about the potentially catastrophic impact of global warming from the burning of fossil fuels. The revelation comes in a study published in the journal Global Environmental Change. Here's the BBC's Danny Eberhard. The study is an attempt to appraise how Total, one of the world's biggest oil companies, dealt with the issue of climate change over decades. The authors quote an article published in the company's own magazine in 1971. It predicts temperature rises, the possibility of ice caps partially melting and has a strikingly accurate forecast of rises of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. The study goes on to accuse Total of going through different phases, first staying quiet on the subject of climate change in public, then promoting uncertainty about the science behind it, before, in the late 1990s, moving to a position where it did not openly dispute the science, but, the authors claim, downplayed its urgency and continued to develop oil and gas production. Total says its knowledge of climate risk was no different to that published in the scientific journals of the time and that it monitored the climate science available. It says that since 2015 it's been transforming its operations profoundly towards renewable energy. Environmental campaigners dispute this, accusing the company of a greenwashing rebranding campaign. They're calling for banks to cut ties with the company, saying it should be held accountable for what they describe as stolen time. And that's the BBC's Danny Eberhard. Coming up next here on Hong Kong Today, more sport. As the risk of severe disease and death from COVID-19 increases with age, vaccines are highly recommended for the elderly. Common side effects are usually mild and temporary. Experts advise that those who have had flu shots before can safely receive COVID-19 vaccines. Even if you have a disease, you should get vaccinated as long as your condition is stable. Just staying home doesn't mean you're free from the risk of infection. Protect yourself. Get vaccinated early. Time for another look at sports. I'm Adam Jung. We start again in the Champions League where Manchester United staged a dramatic second-half comeback to beat Atalanta 3-2 at Old Trafford. The Italian side led 2-0 at halftime, then goals in the second half from Marcus Rashford and Harry Maguire tied it before Cristiano Ronaldo scored the winner to move United top of Group F. Here's the United boss, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. It's just in the DNA of this uh, club and the fans and uh, the players just kept on believing. You know, we, we came into half time not really, uh, we didn't deserve to be 2 0 down. We created chances, should have scored a few, and they didn't have too many, but they scored. And we, we felt a bit hard done by, but we knew if we keep on playing and if, if we got the first goal, that will change the, the mood of the game. Was it always going to be Cristiano Ronaldo to get the winner? Of course, <laughs> that's just what he does. And uh, I, think, I think he's proven to everyone that if they want to criticise him for work rate, I think just watch this game. In the same group, Villarreal went third after beating Young Boys 4-1 in Switzerland. Juventus made it three wins out of three with a 1-0 success over Zenit St. Petersburg. Juve lead Chelsea by three points in Group H. Chelsea dominated Malmo, winning 4-0 at Stamford Bridge, but lost Romelu Lukaku and Timo Werner to injury. Here's the Chelsea boss, Thomas Tuchel. We never liked this. It can happen during a season. One is a total unpredictable, a foul and a twist of the ankle from Romelu. And the second one is like we didn't see it coming, a muscle injury from Timo. He's normally not the guy who has muscle injuries. Uh, yeah, we are sad, of course, and, and never happy because we like to have the full squad and, and the two are very dangerous and decisive players for us up front. But these things happen, so now we need to try to find solutions without them. But overall, we are, we are very happy with the performance and the win. Barcelona recorded their first win in Group E as they got past Dinamo Kiev 1-0 at the new camp. Group leaders Bayern Munich thrashed Benfica 4-0. The BBC's John Bennett reports. 
It's two wins in a row for Ronald Koeman and Barcelona since the international break and after all their on and off pitch issues they now have some momentum going into El Clasico at the weekend. Gerard Piquet scored their first Champions League goal of the season, a volley at the back post in a game they dominated. De Jong, Dest and Fatty were guilty of missing good chances but they finally have three points on the board. Meanwhile in Lisbon, Benfica managed to frustrate informed Bayern Munich for 70 minutes but the floodgates finally opened after a wonderful Leroy Sané free kick. An own goal, Robert Lewandowski's 42nd goal of the calendar year and another Sané strike followed as they maintain their perfect start to this season's group stage. RB Salzburg top group G after a 3-1 win at home to Wolfsburg. Lille and Sevilla played to a goalless draw. Manager Steve Bruce has left Newcastle by mutual consent just 13 days after the club was sold to Saudi Arabian owners. Bruce was in charge of the team's 3-2 loss to Spurs on Sunday, and that was his last game with the club. More from the BBC's Ian Dennis. Newcastle United have placed on record their gratitude to Steve Bruce and wish him well for the future. The 60-year-old took charge of his 1,000th match as a manager at the weekend. Managing Newcastle was his dream job, although with the criticism and abuse he's faced, it must have felt like a nightmare at times. He's also a realist and knew since the recent takeover that the new owners would want a new manager. Newcastle United are one of three Premier League clubs who are yet to win this season and they face Crystal Palace away on Saturday. Graham Jones will take temporary charge, which suggests a permanent replacement is not imminent. That's all the sports for now. We'll have more in 25 minutes. Thanks, Adam. Now the weather forecast. Sunny intervals with a few showers. Highs expected today of around 28 degrees. Winds light to moderate easterlies, becoming moderate to fresh east and fresh northerlies later. Temperatures will fall significantly to around 20 degrees at night. Forecasters say it will be cooler with a few rain patches in the next couple of days. 26 degrees right now, relative humidity 85%. It's now half past seven. With a news summary, here's Barry O'Rourke. The man accused of carrying out the deadliest attack on a US high school has pleaded guilty to the killings. Nicholas Cruz has been charged with 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. Prosecutors have described the killings in Florida in 2018 as cold, calculated and premeditated. They're seeking the death penalty. Speaking in court, Cruz apologised to the victims. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. And I am doing this for you, and I do not care if you do not believe me. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me. But I have to live with this every day. And it brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes. Experts in the U.S. state of Florida are investigating whether suspected human remains found in a park belong to Brian Laundrie. He's the boyfriend of a young woman found murdered in the state of Wyoming last month. Gabby Petito, who kept a travel blog, went missing weeks earlier while on a road trip with Mr. Laundrie. FBI Special Agent Michael McPherson gave this update at a news conference. Earlier today, investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundry. These items were found in an area that up until recently have been underwater. Our evidence response team is on scene using all available forensic resources to process the area. It's likely the team will be on scene for several days. The European Parliament has awarded the Sakharov Human Rights Prize to Russia's most prominent opposition figure, Alexei Navalny. The 45-year-old is currently serving a two-and-a-half-year jail sentence in Russia. His group called it a prize for supporters of truth. Announcing the award, Heidi Hautala, the European Parliament's vice president, paid tribute to Mr Navalny's bravery and resilience. Alexei Navalny has showed great courage in his attempts to restore the freedom of choice to the Russian people. For many years, he has fought for human rights and fundamental freedom in his, in his country. This has cost him his freedom and nearly his life. On behalf of the European Parliament, I call for his immediate and unconditional release. President Putin has ordered that Russians be given paid time off work amid concerns over rising COVID infections. Nine days from the 30th of October have been declared an extended non-working week. Only about one in three Russians have been fully jabbed so far. 
A parliamentary inquiry into, in Brazil into the government's handling of the pandemic is expected to recommend that President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with various offences, including crimes against humanity. The president's critics have long accused him of refusing to take COVID-19 seriously, despite the threats and deaths of more than 600,000 Brazilians. More news on the hour from RTHK. Thanks to Barry O'Rourke in our newsroom. This is Hong Kong Today with me, Janice Wong, and Samantha Butler. Still to come in the final half hour, we'll talk to a doctor about a resurgence of a bacterial infection that's killed seven people in the last two months. Russia's opposition leader gets high-profile international recognition. It's a particular honour for me to announce the decision of the Conference of Presidents to award the Saharov Prize in 2021 to Alexei Navalny. And a group of Netflix employees stage a walkout at company headquarters over controversial comments from a U.S. comedian. But first, the chief executive has acknowledged that national security law has damaged Hong Kong's reputation and the government should do more to explain its work to the rest of the world. The comments came on a new RTHK program featuring the chief executive. Joanne Wong reports. Carrie Lam spoke about her latest policy address in the government's work over the past four years on a new RTHK TV program called Overview Policy. The chief executive said some external forces and Western media have played up routine enforcement of the national security law, likening it to the suppression of human rights and freedoms. To counter that narrative, she said the government needs to explain its work better. Mr. Slam also stressed the need for the government to tell it like it is when it comes to Hong Kong's constitutional order. For example, she said the government needs to state clearly to the people that the central government has comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong and that it also respects the SAR's high degree of autonomy. The CE added that Hong Kong must remain a cosmopolitan city so that it can play its role as a connector between mainland China and the rest of the world. Joanne Wong reporting. The Legislative Council has passed a bill that will limit rent hikes of subdivided flats and give tenants the priority to renew their lease. Under the new law, rent hikes will be capped at 10% at the end of a two-year contract. Tenants will then be given priority to renew the lease for another two years. The chairman of the committee that vetted the bill, DAB lawmaker Vincent Chang, said the passage of the bill is an important step towards protecting grassroots tenants. He spoke to Wang Yinting. More than 200,000 of people living in this very bad conditional uh, subdivided effects, especially in the old buildings. So today we have this bill to have more protection for those people who live in the subdivided effects, especially for their rank, because we know that they are paying a very high rank. It can compare to the very expensive place in units. So this bill mainly protects the rank percentage add-on and also for those two and two years, like four years contract, so they can have more time for them to stay, no need to worry about the keep raising their, their rank. So this is the first step we are talking about to protect the subdivided effects, and this is the first stage. When do you expect the rent control will come into effect? After this bill passed, we are, we are, they are talking about three months for this process. So probably on January, they are going to process everything. This three months is very important. We keep on urging government to have more uh, promotion to let all the people know the rank, the bill details, so that they can know what's the, what's the landlord responsibility and also who, who live in there, they, they, how can they protect themselves. Are you fear that some landlord will increase the rent immediately, like before January, before the rental price got controlled under the bill? Or are you afraid this will further increase tenants' financial burden? Well, I really don't hope that it's going to happen. I hope that the public know that the situation for those people who live in the subdivided banks, they are already in the very difficulty. And um, they are mainly like 
half of the salary paying this rent. So I, I don't really think that the landlord can easily keep on adding the rent before the spill come out. But we do hope that the government should have more promotion for the public to let them make sure that this bill is for them to protect themselves. Some lawmakers said initial rent should be included as to avoid flat owners overcharging tenants. What do you think about this idea? For DAB, we support this initial rent, but of course, we understand the government talking about it's very difficult for them to uh, know the prices in between the whole uh, area, every unit, what's the budget and the price. So we urge the government, we will have this bill passed first. We hope the government is going to have the research in this coming two years, make sure that they know that what is the rank and how's the increasement coming up. So after two years, if the rank is still going crazy, we will urge the government to make the initial rank coming. That's the DAB lawmaker, Vincent Cheng. Experts have advised people not to pick up raw fish by hand after the city reported 79 cases of invasive Group B streptococcus over the past two months, in which seven of the patients died. Health authorities say the figure is substantially higher than the 9 to 26 cases a month reported over the past three years. Investigations show some of the patients handled freshwater fish before the onset of the disease. To discuss this further, we're joined on the line now by infectious disease expert Dr Joseph Jung. Good morning, Dr Jung. Morning, Samantha. So tell us about this Group B streptococcus infection. Yeah, uh, Group B streptococcus infection actually is um, consider quite um, um, ordinary and common uh, pathogens that usually are identified um, over the skin surface. <clears throat> um, it is considered to be a gram-positive organism, so, so um, uh, uh, which is also um, u- usually identified in our uh, daily livings. Um, these kind of uh, infections are somehow commonly affects uh, uh, the women and the neonates um, more common in the past. But uh, for some group of patients uh, in particular, if their immunity uh, somehow is weakened or uh, those uh, with chronic illness such as diabetes, liver cirrhosis, chronic renal failure, uh, cancer patients who is being on immunosuppressants, are uh, all considered to be at risk of um, uh, getting an invasive form of group B streptococcal uh, infections. So uh, once the bacteria somehow get into the bloodstream, it can somehow disseminate to different organs uh, of your body, including the brain, including your heart, uh, the bone, joint, liver, as well as uh, other parts of the body. So it can cause a uh, a very severe infection uh, without a uh, correct and appropriate dosage of the antibiotics. It can somehow end up into uh, death. So I urge the public to be aware of this kind of box whenever you are uh, in close contact with uh, those uh, water fish um, uh, in the market. So uh, after um, bringing home those seafoods, make sure that you wear the gloves, protect yourself before touching or handling uh, those fish and uh, seafood. And now, you mentioned this is an ordinary and common bacteria. Then why is there this sudden surge in cases of uh, hospitalizations and deaths in the past two months? Well, this is uh, the issue or perspective that uh, um, I think uh, the uh, Centre for Health Protection has to uh, go for investigations. Um, one of the factors that I am um, postulating that is uh, likely the virulence uh, of this uh, bug somehow uh, changes, and that's why it caused a lot of uh, cases recently. Um, according to the uh, CHP investigation, uh, this time the invasive uh, group B streptococcus. Um, belongs to serial group three um, uh, with um, uh, some uh, genetic sequencing showing that it, uh, it belongs to ST283. Uh, um, so we are wondering whether this kind of um, uh, uh, species is somehow um, more um, dangerous or somehow be more infectious in a way that it can cause 
uh, uh, severe illness, not just only affecting the high risk group of patients, elderly, but also for young adults. So um, it can also cause invasive disease, not just only minor form of the illness. So uh, uh, so that's why uh, CHP make an announcement, um, issue a press release, um, reminding the people in Hong Kong to be cautious whenever they need to go to the market and purchase uh, seafood and fish. Uh, now, you mentioned that um, elderly is uh, one of the high risk of, of cases. Is that where the deaths mainly were, these seven deaths over the past two months? Well, uh, yeah, I think we need to look into uh, the details about those uh, seven people who has passed away. Um, but according to the, um, the journals, as well as some of the literature reviews in the past, saying that uh, for elderly more than 65 years old of age, uh, the, the mortality rate is relatively higher than uh, young adults, um, mainly because their immune system is somehow not as strong as the adults. Um, besides, uh, most of the elderly people, they do have other comorbidities. So that's why explain uh, the mortality rate is much higher uh, among elderly uh, generations. And I guess uh, early in- early medical intervention would help your chances of recovering. What are some early warning signs of this infection? Well, the early warning sign for uh, invasive would be streptococcus mainly includes uh, fever, chills and rigors, headache, uh, some dizziness, excessive tiredness, fatigue, uh, with a uh, decrease in appetite. Um, sometimes in the uh, later stage, the patient's mental status may also be affected. Uh, so always would like to go to the bed and sleep a lot. And um, so this is some of the warning signs that I would suggest their family members to bring the patients to the uh, emergency department for medical consultations. So uh, what else can the government do to prevent these cases? Do, do they need to look at the hygiene of markets or just check where the source of the fish are coming from? Well, I think um, this is quite uh, a, a, a case, a clustering of uh, older cases that warrants further investigation in order to trace the origins of uh, the outbreaks. Are there any uh, places or any, um, I mean, the, um, uh, the, 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 the purchase, I mean, the uh, transportation, um, whether there's any um, um, contaminations uh, in the wholesale market um, uh, of uh, the fish, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, fish tanks, all these kind of things. They, we have to look into those uh, areas, whether... Uh, there is any common linkage among all these markets so as to uh, abolish um, the transmission linkage. Mm. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. That's Dr Joseph Jung, infectious disease expert. It's now 14 minutes to 8 on Hong Kong Today. A construction workers' union has urged the government to carry out more short-term projects to create more jobs. The union made the call as it announced that wages for workers would remain frozen for another year. Natalie Ching reports. At a press briefing, the Hong Kong Construction Industry Employees General Union said the decision to have a pay freeze was made following talks with members, contractor associations and other stakeholders. This means the wages of 15 major occupations in the industry will remain unchanged for the fourth year in a row. Chairman of the union, Wang Ping, said a survey it did in July and August showed the sector is still recovering from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as filibustering in Lachko and protests in recent years. He said it interviewed around 1,700 workers and found that the average unemployment rate was around 9.3 percent and underemployment rate was around 14 percent. 
Hong Wai Leung, also from the union, urged the government to undertake more short-term contracts for building works, saying mega projects like Lantau Tomorrow or the Northern Metropolis can't help them make ends meet in the near term. We hope the government can do more short-term works, such as renovating public toilets or pedestrian pathways, fixing the homes of elderly people who live alone, or replacing old pipes in public housing estates. Ng said, he said this could not only create more jobs but improve people's quality of life. Lawmaker Jeffrey Lam has warned that Hong Kong exporters face the risk of failing to get their products overseas in time for Christmas amid an unprecedented backlog in U.S. ports. He urged the government to be flexible in allowing airlines to repurpose passenger flights to carry cargo, as some companies have switched to air freight. The Business and Professionals Alliance lawmaker says local businesses have been forking out 10 times more money to hire shipping containers due to a shortage caused by the cargo surge in Long Beach and Los Angeles. If the goods are not in the buyer's hand on time, Hong Kong exporters or factories may face different consequences, such as delay payment or buyer refuse to pay. If the buyer decided to cancel the order, then the Hong Kong company will be stuck with the merchandise. If it is pure Christmas merchandise, it will be stuck for one year. And then the next year, whether the Christmas merchandise will be in trend or not, that would be a question. The European Parliament has awarded the Sakharov Human Rights Prize to the jailed Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny. The announcement was made by the European Parliament's Vice President Heidi Hautala, who described Mr Navalny as a tireless fighter for freedom. Alexei Navalny has showed great courage in his attempts to restore the freedom of choice to the Russian people. This has cost him his freedom and nearly his life. On behalf of the European Parliament, I call for his immediate and unconditional release. Mr. Navalny remains in jail and his organization is banned in Russia. He nearly died in August last year when he was attacked with Novichok nerve agent in Siberia. This was the reaction of NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. I think this is a part of a, a pattern where we see that uh, Russia has... Uh, become more oppressive abroad and more oppressive at home and more uh, aggressive abroad. And therefore, I welcome the fact that uh, a strong voice, uh, an important politician in Russia has been awarded this uh, uh, prize. This year's award is a particularly poignant moment for Alexei Navalny and his supporters, especially as it's named after the Soviet dissident and human rights activist Andrei Sakharov. Baris Akunin is a Russian-Georgian writer who knows Alexei Navalny well. He says the prize could pressure the Russian authorities to release Mr Navalny. The first thing that came to my mind was that now... Uh, that now it would be more difficult for them to kill him in prison (laughs) and that continuing to keep him in prison would be more of a problem. I think that it might make a difference. They pay attention to this sort of thing and all of us are very much worried about Alexei Navalny's destiny. I would say that it definitely makes his imprisonment a bigger problem for them. I'm sure of that. This is all about balancing things. Which coast is bigger? So it all is important. And after all, they are pragmatists, people in in Kremlin. I follow everything that he writes and says now in prison. I am sure that he will respond. And, uh, well, of course, it would make him in his impossibly difficult situation even stronger. So I'm very grateful for this prize for him. There are fresh warnings in Britain about people being drugged unknowingly at nightclubs and parties. And now it's not just drinks being spiked. The latest reports speak of people being injected with drugs. The BBC's Joe Black has spoken to a woman who believes she was injected against her will on a night out in Nottingham. After a night out at a club in Nottingham, Sarah Buckle, a second-year university student, became so unwell, she ended up in hospital. The 19-year-old believed she was given an injection without her knowledge. I was almost screaming out for help and then almost going unconscious and coming back around and choking. And they could just tell immediately, wait, it's not that she's had 
too much to drink, something's really, really wrong. I have no memory of anything. Posts on social media talk of similar incidents and now a petition calling for compulsory searches at nightclubs has been signed by more than 130,000 people. The problem of people having their drinks spiked with substances in nighttime venues has been reported for many years. Now there are new fears injection spiking is on the rise. However, only a small number of police forces throughout the UK have had reports of this happening. Despite this, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has asked police forces for an urgent update on the issue. Back in Nottingham, Sarah Buckle says it will be a long time before she can enjoy another night out, but she hopes her story will be a warning to others. The United States has told a World Trade Organization review that China appears to have no intention to change its unfair practices. A U.S. trade official, David Bisbee, said that two decades after joining the WTO, China still didn't play by its rules. He criticized Beijing for using policies that gave Chinese firms an advantage. He also condemned China's use of what he called economic coercion against smaller trading partners and said reports of forced labor in some sectors of the Chinese economy could not be ignored. China's 20-year record at the WTO is being examined in a periodic trade policy review required of all members. Earlier, Xinhua News agency said the policy review would be attended by the commerce minister and vice minister in Beijing via video link and China's ambassador to the WTO, Li Chenggang in Geneva. The commerce ministry said over the past 20 years, China had fully fulfilled its secession commitments, actively participated in the work of the WTO and made great contributions to upholding the multilateral trading system. Facebook has announced it's hiring 10,000 workers to build its metaverse, but can it handle the project? The social media giant has been facing significant pressure. There were the allegations by a former employee that the company was harming children and destabilizing democracies. The company is also fighting, fighting regulatory and legislative battles. And this month, Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram went offline for five hours after routine maintenance went wrong, disrupting all of Facebook's services. Cara Swisher is a podcast host and opinion writer for the New York Times. Yes, they've created such a bad social media environment. I don't think we should trust them with a metaverse, right? Which is, which is sort of it, tripling and amplifying and doubling and tripling down on what they're already doing. And they already show they can't really run a social media network very well. So creating virtual spaces is another thing. But, but let me tell you how they define it. They say a metaverse is a set of virtual spaces where you can create and explore with other people who aren't in the same physical spaces as you. You'll be able to hang out with friends, work, play, learn, shop, create, and more. Just like the internet, the metaverse exists whether Facebook is there or not. Well, of course, they want to play a big role. And they bought Oculus, which was the, you know, the, the, the physical device you use. They're, I would say glasses, but they're much more than that. And they're heavier. And so they sure they'll be good at it. They've got Oculus. They've got everybody's social graph. They could you just glomming on more stuff so you can see things. So you wear glasses and you're living in a different world. You can interact with people. Again, this has been depicted in science fiction over and over again. There's been lots of different worlds like this that you play online when you're playing video games, you know, or Minecraft, you're in a metaverse. I mean, people have really, this this pandemic for all this negative stuff has gotten people used to living their lives online, right? But it's kind of a clunky, kludgy way to do it, Zoom and, and Skype or whatever. And this is sort of a, a more like as if you're in the real world. That's a Cara Swisher, a podcast host and opinion writer for the New York Times. It's now coming up to four minutes to eight on Hong Kong Today, and we'll have the sports news right after this. The chief executive has announced the 2021 policy address. With the national security law and improved electoral system, Hong Kong is back on the right track of one country, two systems. We will continue to leverage our unique advantages to boost the economy. The artificial islands in the central waters and the northern metropolis development strategy will fundamentally resolve the land and housing problem. Building a bright future together, the 2021 Policy Address. Time for our last look at sports. I'm Adam Jung. We start with football's European Champions League and a bit of magic from Cristiano Ronaldo. Shaw now sends over a cross from the left. Cristiano! United. 
Manchester United staged a dramatic second half comeback to beat Atalanta 3-2 at Old Trafford. Trailing 2-0 at half, United got goals from Marcus Rashford and Harry Maguire to tie it before Ronaldo scored the winner. That moved Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side to the top of Group F. It's just in the DNA of this uh, club and the fans and uh, the players just kept on believing. You know, we, we came into half-time not really... Uh, we didn't deserve to be 2-0 down. We created chances, should have scored a few, and they didn't have too many, but they scored. And we, we felt a bit hard done by, but we knew if we keep on playing and if, if, if we got the first goal, that will change the, the mood of the game. Was it always going to be Cristiano Ronaldo to get the winner? Of course, <laughs> that's just what he does. And uh, I, think, I think he's proven to everyone that if they want to criticise him for work rate, I think just watch this game. In the same group, Villarreal went third after a 4-1 win over Young Boys in Switzerland. A late header from Dejan Kulusevski gave Juventus a 1-0 victory at Zenit St. Petersburg. Juve's third win in three games puts them three points above Chelsea at the top of Group H. Chelsea thrashed Malmo 4-0 at Stamford Bridge, but lost Romelu Lukaku and Timo Werner to injury. Boss Thomas Tuchel has confirmed that both players will miss games. We never liked this can happen during a season. One is uh, total unpredictable, a foul and a twist of the ankle from Romelu. And the second one is like we didn't see it coming, a muscle injury from Timo. He's normally not the guy who has muscle injuries. Uh, yeah, we are sad, of course, and, and never happy because we like to have the full squad and, and the two are very dangerous and decisive players for us up front. But these things happen, so now we need to try to find solutions without them. But overall, we are, we are very happy with the performance and the win. Elsewhere in the Champions League, Barcelona got past Dinamo Kiev 1-0 at the new Camp for their first win in Group E. The leaders Bayern Munich thrashed Benfica 4-0. RB Salzburg topped Group G after a 3-1 win over Wolfsburg. Lille and Sevilla played to a goalless draw. In the Europa League, Leicester City came from 2-0 down to beat Spartak 4-3 in Moscow. Pats and Dakas scored all four goals for Leicester and they're up to second in Group C. And finally, manager Steve Bruce has left Newcastle by mutual consent just 13 days after Saudi Arabian investors took over the club. Bruce was in charge of the team's 3-2 loss to Spurs on Sunday and that was his last game at St. James's Park. And that's your look at sports. Thanks, Atom. A quick look at the weather before we go. Sunny intervals with a few showers. The top temperature will be around 28 degrees. Winds light to moderate easterlies. Right now it's 27 degrees. Relative humidity, 83%. The mainland and Hong Kong are connected. We all do our best with what we have to achieve a bright future together. The 8 o'clock news with Barry O'Rourke. The man accused of carrying out the deadliest attack on a US high school has pleaded guilty to the killings. Nicholas Cruz has been charged with 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. Prosecutors have described the killings in Florida in 2018 as cold, calculated and premeditated. They're seeking the death penalty. Speaking in court, Cruz apologised to the victims. I am very sorry for what I did and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. And I am doing this for you, and I do not care if you do not believe me. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me. But I have to live with this every day. 
and it brings me nightmares and I can't live with myself sometimes. A parliamentary inquiry in Brazil into the government's handling of the pandemic is expected to recommend that President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with various offences, including crimes against humanity. The president's critics have long accused him of refusing to take COVID-19 seriously, despite the deaths of more than 600,000 Brazilians. Luiz Enrique Mandetta was Brazil's health minister when the virus took hold. He says herd immunity was Mr. Bolsonaro's response. There was some other people around him that had a theory that to treat the disease just like a flu. So for a long period of time, he never wore masks. He would shake hands with people. They deliberate didn't make the trials with Pfizer to buy the vaccines in the beginning. So it delayed about 10 months the Brazilian response to the disease, and that made a huge difference on it. President Putin has ordered that Russians be given paid time off work amid concerns over rising COVID infections. Nine days from the 30th of October have been declared an extended non-working week. Only about one in three Russians have been fully jabbed so far. You're listening to the news on RTHK. AM, FM and live online. This is Radio 3. Good morning. It's 8.03 in Hong Kong on Thursday, the 21st of October. A warm welcome to Money Talk on Radio 3 with me, Peter Lewis. Home prices in mainland China fell for the first time in six years. The National Bureau of Statistics reported Wednesday that new home prices in 70 cities slid 0.1% in September from August, the first drop since April 2015. A 2.6 billion US dollar deal to take a stake in China Evergrande's property services unit has collapsed. Real estate firm Hobson Development was set to buy a 51% stake in Evergrande Property Services Group. Hobson said that Evergrande told it the deal had been terminated on the 13th of October. And the parties said in separate filings to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange yesterday that they were unable to agree on the terms of the deal. Lawmaker Jeffrey Lam warned yesterday that Hong Kong exporters face the risk of failing to get their products overseas in time for Christmas because of an unprecedented backlog at US ports. He warned that Hong Kong exporters could suffer from cash flow problems if they fail to deliver their products on time and local businesses have been paying up to 10 times more than usual to hire shipping containers. U.S. Federal Reserve Government's Randall Qualls warned yesterday of upside risks to inflation next year, and he said the Fed was increasingly focused on monitoring whether elevated prices were affecting the economy for too long. He said if inflation does remain more than moderately above 2%, be assured that the FOMC has the framework and the tools to address it. On today's Money Talk, we're joined by personal wealth advisor Enzio von Fahl and Jack Su, CIO for Greater China at Credit Suisse. Discussing Hong Kong's MPF scheme is Francis Chung, executive chairman of MPF Ratings. Money Talk on RTHK Radio 3. On Wall Street, U.S. stocks rose for the sixth consecutive day as companies continue to report strong third quarter earnings. The Dow gained 152 points, or 0.4%, to 35,609, touching an all-time high of 35,669 earlier in the session. While it surpassed its high from August on an intraday basis, the Dow ended the session 0.1% away from its record close. The S&P 500 added 0.4% to 4,536 and ended the day less than 0.2% from a record high. The Nasdaq Composite retreated 0.1% to 15,121. After the bell, electric car maker Tesla reported record third quarter revenue and profits. The company reported 1.62 billion US dollars in net profit for the quarter, the second time it surpassed 1 billion dollars on revenues of 13.76 billion. Compared to 12 months ago, net profits soared 389%, driven by an improvement in gross margins of 30.5% on its automotive business. Shares of Tesla are down 1.3% in after-hours trading. 
and PayPal. The online payments company is in talks to acquire social media group Pinterest for about 45 billion US dollars in what would be one of the largest corporate takeover deals of the year. PayPal has reportedly offered $70 a share, paid mainly in stock for Pinterest, and shares in Pinterest jumped to almost 13% while PayPal fell almost 5%. The Pan-European Stock 600 Index rose a third of a percent in the UK. The FTSE 100 added 0.1%. Hong Kong shares rallied on Wednesday for a fourth straight day. The Hang Seng Index climbed 349 points, or 1.4%, to a six-week high of 26,136. Tech shares surged in Hong Kong, with the Hang Seng Tech Index jumping 2.6% after speculation mounted that the crackdown on the tech sector on the mainland would ease. Shares of Billy Billy and JD Health both rose over 6%. Guaisho and Baidu jumped over 4% and Tencent was up over 2%. Shares of Alibaba soared over 6% after Alibaba Cloud launched its fourth generation chip architecture Wednesday and says it plans data centers in Korea and Thailand in 2022. And that helped fuel speculation that Alibaba's relationships with the regulators was improving. On the mainland, the Shanghai Composite Index was down 0.2% at 3,587. The CSI Coal Index of major miners listed in China plunged as much as 8.5%. In the commodities markets, Brent crude oil is up almost 1% to a fresh three-year high of $85.92 a barrel. Gold was boosted by the weaker dollar, rising 0.7% to $1,783 an ounce. The U.S. 10-year Treasury bond yield rose two basis points to 1.66%. And the U.S. dollar index fell 0.2% to its lowest level in a month. The euro is at $1.16.5. The buck's trading at 114.4 Japanese yen. One British pound buys $1.38.25 and 10 Hong Kong dollars and 75 cents. The Chinese yuan is at 6.39 and a quarter in offshore markets. And Bitcoin has hit a new record high, surging past $67,000. It reached a high overnight of 67,016. On Tuesday, the first US Bitcoin linked exchange traded fund made its debut on the New York Stock Exchange. The ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF, which tracks Bitcoin futures rather than the crypto itself, jumped 4.8% on its first day of trading and rose another 3.2% yesterday. Bitcoin, meanwhile, has come off its highs, trading this morning at $66,000. And let's take a look at uh, U.S. stocks, uh, Asian stocks this morning. The SX200 in Australia right now is off about a third of a percent. Nikkei 225 in Japan down about two thirds of a percent. And futures markets indicating a decline of about a quarter of a percent for the Hang Seng at the open this morning. Coming up to 8.10, let's go and join our Thursday morning guests. We have with us, as always, personal wealth advisor, Enzio von Farr. Morning, Enzio. Morning to you, Peter. And also joining us, Jack Sue, who is Chief Investment Officer for Greater China at Credit Suisse. Morning, Jack. Good morning, Pete. Home prices in mainland China fell for the first time in six years, showing the extent of the contagion from the Evergrande debt crisis. The National Bureau of Statistics reported Wednesday that new home prices in 70 cities slid 0.08% in September from August. That's the first first drop since April 2015. Among China's 70 major cities, just 27 saw new home prices rise month on month in September compared to 46 cities in August. And values in the secondary market declined 0.2% down for a second month. And existing home sales plunged 63% from a year earlier in the first 17 days of October. Andrew and Jack, um, try and give me a sense of how serious this slowdown is. I know in terms of price, it's, it's only a small decline, but we have been used to month after month of price rises, and we're seeing sales sort of plunge quite significantly. How, how, how serious is this decline in the property sector? Well, to top your numbers, the, the excavator sales, which is something that people tend to follow just as a, as a hands-on bit of economics, they've actually fallen by about 38% year-on-year in September, and the developer sales have fallen by 36%. So I'm afraid, sir, that puts your 0.8 a little bit in the shade in terms of severity of the, down, of the downturn. 
Well, um, if I just add to these uh, extraordinarily bad figures that we've seen, uh, number one, in September, uh, everyone is aware that mortgage approvals have been delayed inside China. Typically, it takes you a month to get your mortgage approved. Now, you have to take two to three months to get your mortgage approved. So as a result, sales, you know, with the lag or smaller number of uh, buyers in the market that can execute a deal, um, supply of properties versus demand is much higher, resulting in a fall in prices. And uh, we also seen in the first two weeks of October that the data for sales have also been quite disappointing. Mm. But the good news is um, there's been some message from the central authority asking the banks to, number one, uh, reduce your mortgage rates. Number two, um, to accelerate your mortgage approvals because uh, some developers, as we know, are under severe pressure as sales or cash receivables have turned into the pockets too slow, leading to some default events that already happened. So mm. we think this is quite severe. And uh, that is leading to, uh, I guess, a lot of volatility in the property stocks and the bond markets. Without further policy intervention, uh, we are at further risk of property price falling. What sort of policy intervention would you like to see? We do need to see the authority um, providing more lending um, to the real estate developers uh, in onshore banks, which has started to happen. Uh, We need to see that uh, public confidence in developers to return, otherwise, uh, everyone is on wait and see mode until what mm. we until the Evergrande situation uh, is uh, kind of resolved. Um, to, um, you know, people are waiting to see that developers are actually safe uh, to buy from. That, that's the key thing, isn't it? There's a big confidence crisis of confidence now because people have seen China Evergrande and other uh, developers take deposits because that's the model there on mainland China isn't it to pre-sale yes before they've even built these properties and take a hundred percent of the money um, it's caused a big crisis of confidence it once that happens it's difficult to reverse isn't it well we assume that given this how systemic the risk could be uh, if without further intervention and we have already seen the authority came out in early October to uh, tell the banks to, uh, I guess, address this issue. And then it came up again on the 15th of October uh, Mm -hmm. with uh, further adjustments and fine tuning of real estate policy that's been, I guess, too fast and too aggressive. And so uh, we assume they are already on top of this issue. And uh, we will expect that uh, if further price falls are happening and further defaults are happening, they will likely be stepping in again to fine tune policies. Mm -hmm. Peter, if I may just add to that what, what Jack was saying, um, just a couple of numbers. The existing, the, since they put in these these measures back in August, I guess they took out about five trillion in debt, and the total debt outstanding just for mortgages and, and property related is seven point eight trillion. That is about half of China's GDP. Mm. Just to give you a sort of a relative figure, um, so. I kind of wonder whether all of this isn't going to actually make that rule of law, that sort of Moby Dick of of China, actually become more of a reality because if the little people don't get their flats that they've actually paid for in via a pre-sale, if they don't get them, they're going to be very angry mm. and they're going to have to have some form of recourse. So I kind of wonder if there's that's maybe not the the blessing in disguise that this that the pain threshold gets so big that somebody says, hey, we have to have some proper laws in place to ensure that this not just regulations but laws to protect the little guy. So do you think if the pain threshold gets too large, um, we start to see maybe the central government change its its views on companies like Evergrande and step in to try and bail them out? Uh, well, I think so, but I'm not a company guy, as you know. Never was, frankly. But um, so I think that... Um, you, you will find that too big to fail it comes back in yet again. Um, is it a Lehman moment? I don't know. I think it's more like Japan. I think it's an internal implosion into China itself mm-hmm. as opposed to an external global crisis. Um, but um, I think that they will have to bail out somebody. And that's, again, Evergrande, as I, from what I've read, the, the Wall Street Journal ran, ran, ran an excellent article on this a couple of weeks ago, um, that, the, uh, that, that Evergrande, as we all know, is really just the tip of the iceberg. Now, there's more news. A 2.6 billion US dollar deal to take a stake in China Evergrande's property services unit has collapsed. It had been reported that real estate firm Hobson Developments was set to buy a 51% stake in Evergrande Property Services Group. Hobson said that Evergrande told it the deal had been terminated on the 13th of October, and the parties said in separate filings 
to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange yesterday that they were unable to agree on the terms of the deal. How big a blow is this to China Evergrande and also its chances of survival because its property services group was sort of regarded as the jewel in the crown of its assets that if it could sell that it could maybe ease some of the stress on the uh, on the group overall i mean i cannot opine on the individual deal itself because um, no one is an insider inside the deal right? i mean is it a price issue uh, is it the terms being too harsh um is it something not acceptable you know the authority is on top of um, Evergrande to resolve its issues to ensure deliveries of their properties, right? So I guess the um, the deal itself may not be the most uh, important thing. Most important is that um, authority are now stepping in into containing a potential risk uh, from a restructuring of this company. And um, we are seeing, I guess, some successes in rebuilding some confidence. Uh, but we need to see more uh, from the authority to contain the situation in, inside the company, ensure the consumers do receive the properties. Uh, this one single deal, uh, I guess, uh, is not the most representative of how the situation uh, could unfold in the coming weeks. I, I think, Peter, if I could, I could just add to what Jack was saying, that the clock is ticking because this is a bit of a mouthful, listeners. The sixth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee is going to be run from the 8th to the 11th of November, and then the National Congress runs next year. So, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of sort of political clocks ticking in mm. China um, to get things going again, and I, th I think that that's going to put, put a little bit of hustle into this whole process. I know also, as, as we all know, that the Central Bank itself actually has come in saying that they were criticizing some of the 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 oversight of these property companies and how they were actually being regulated and run. So uh, there seems to be quite a bit of foot. I just wonder what one it becomes. You know, we need a proper rule of law, some proper legal things protecting mm -hmm. the little guy. I think one one very important message is um, the authorities said they will protect consumers, but they did not say they would protect the investors. So people. Oh who are in as an investor should be pay, should be prepared for the worst. And what about suppliers? They also said they would protect the supply chain. Mm. <laughs> Do you think the authorities are in, in control of this? They keep say, telling us uh, they're on top of the situation and it's not a problem. But, you know, we've had this deal now, an important deal for Evergrande collapse. They're about to go into default on Saturday unless something dramatic happens before then. We've got two others. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, Fantasia and Cynic Holdings have defaulted on bonds. Um, is it really under control? I mean, um, right now we are in a medium to long term um, deleveraging of the property sector. Uh, China's property sector makes up 10% of the GDP uh, at the peak of this cycle right now versus um, the US and Japan who have seen uh, property sector at the peak at 3 to 6% of GDP. China do have an outsized property sector and that needs deleveraging. Mm. Um, for highly leveraged investors, I mean highly leveraged companies, um, they need to continue to deleverage and focus on a free red line rule. And as a result, um, there will be some, uh, I guess, strategic asset needs to be mm -hmm. um, sell and bought into by different uh, companies. Uh, lower leverage uh, SOE companies have the ability to absorb assets. And mm -hmm. some of these highly leveraged companies do have assets uh, covering the entire, um, you know, they do have a high asset ratio. So in other words, um, in order to raise money for these companies, um, they can sell uh, their assets. They can sell um, their valuable subsidiaries at a decent price and uh, still be able to raise cash. Okay. So we look forward to some resolutions in the coming weeks and There's months. There's another aspect to this that I want to ask you about. Um, and that is because of these suspensions on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they've now hit total suspensions here in Hong Kong, have hit a record $61 billion. And we've had um, a to total lack of transparency from the companies involved. They haven't filed any updates. On, on either this deal, which they should do. Um, Evergrande hasn't told us if it intends to pay all the offshore bondholders. Surely this, this lack of transparency and enforcement of the rules by the regulators um, is, is highlighting the lack of protections for small minority shareholders in Hong Kong, isn't it, who have been left uh, in the dark, completely unable to trade their shares. It can't be right. Well, I mean, I'm sure they are following the rules that uh, important announcements have 
can only be announced when they are they know what the result is. Uh, I guess um, it may be for the... Well, that, hang on. They said on the 17th, um, um, Hobson said it was told on... When was it? On, uh, on October the 17th. Uh, that uh, that the uh, 13th of October that this deal wasn't going through. They should have made an announcement, shouldn't they, to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange? This is a severe situation where we're talking about the biggest sector of the world right now. Mm. 30% of China's GDP, 5% of global industrial production in China real estate. Um, we are trying to resolve one of the biggest problems of the world right now. So does I guess that mean, it will take time. Does that mean the rules get suspended then for how to keep investors updated? I mean, Evergrande hasn't said a word about whether it intends to pay offshore bondholders. Surely it should be saying something about that as well. Oh, we are... I guess, all looking forward to some further announcements in the coming days. <laughs> OK. All right, well, thank you both very much. Good to hear your thoughts there. You heard Jack Su, Chief Investment Officer for Greater China at Credit Suisse and Personal Wealth Advisor, Enzio Von Fahl.